My name is Mitzi Sanchez, and I am a survivor of child kidnapping. I grew up in Vallejo, California. That day, once the bell rang for us to go home, all of the kids were outside playing. I left the group of kids and I decided to walk by myself. I was about two blocks away from home when I noticed a man sitting in his car and that seemed off to me. But when I noticed him, he noticed me and I got this yucky feeling in my gut. As I approached the man's car, he got out of his vehicle and came around the car and asked me if I could help him. He said that he could not bend over and he needed my help to pick something up from the floorboard of his car. And he seemed like he was hurt and I believed him. I leaned into the vehicle to pick up the duct tape that was on the floorboard of his car and that's when he leaned over me from behind, covered my mouth, put all of his body weight on top of me so no one around could hear me scream for help. And at that moment, I thought to myself, I am being kidnapped. And my mom always said, if anyone ever tries to grab you, you kick and scream and punch, you fight, you do whatever you can to get away. But I didn't think that I was ever going to have to use her advice. Usually when these types of things happen, it's someone that's close to the family, someone that the child knows, a family member, but this was a total and complete stranger to me. I had never seen him in my life before. So at the time that he grabbed me and put all of his body weight on me, covered my mouth, I was kicking and screaming. I lost control of my bladder, but he was very tall and very heavy and he overpowered me. There was no way that I was able to get out of his hands. So he threw me into the car, rigged the door, so I could not open the door from the inside, but I was stuck in the car. And he drove off with me in the car in the opposite direction of my home. I could see my house. The time that he grabbed me and put me in the car and drove off was nothing but 10 seconds. That's all it takes for someone to snatch your kid. And he drove off to a nearby store, parked in the parking lot, made me change my clothes and instantly began to feed me alcohol. And I remember just saying to him, I can't drink, I'm eight years old, I'm not allowed to drink. And he was like, just shut up and drink it. And I even remembered asking him, why did you take me? And he said, someone did it to me when I was little. I'm eight years old trying to process what is going on? And so I thought to myself, am I gonna do this to kids when I grow up? So we stayed in the car for the three days that I was with him. I never left the car. Right after he fed me the alcohol and he made me change my clothes, he drove me to a rest area that sits right at the top of the hill of Vallejo and it overlooks the entire city. And he parked there for the first night and he covered the windows with visors and blankets and towels so nobody could see inside of the car. By the time the sun started to go down, I began to wonder if my family was looking for me or if they knew what had happened to me. I was worried that they didn't know that nobody saw that I was taken. And so the first night that we stayed at the rest area, that's when the abuse happened. But that was also the first time that I tried to escape. I started to look for ways to leave. I asked him if I can use the restroom and he said, no, I couldn't. Cause I thought, well, maybe if I use the restroom I can get away there and maybe ask for help. But no, he pulled out a long, chain and tied it around my left ankle, tied it to the gear shift and handed me a Tupperware to urinate in. And as the hours went by, it got darker and darker. And I even saw a police officer drive by, but he just kept driving. And that's when I began to lose hope. So for three days, I learned about alcohol, drugs, abuse, kidnappings, all from this strange man who smelled like cigarettes and alcohol. And I had no idea that the, these things were real. I thought that they were only in movies. For three days, I had no food. I had no water. It was summer. It was hot. I was in a beat up Oldsmobile with no AC. So as the time went by, I began to get weak. I didn't have the nutrients that my body needed in order to survive for a long period of time. At the moment that he took out that long chain and wrapped it around me, he said to me, 
I've done this to many girls and none of them have gotten away. So don't even try. He's a professional. He's kidnapped and murdered 10 girls, young baby girls. He knows what he's doing. So he knows what we're up to when we're asking these questions because of his experience. And he tried to put fear in me so that I wouldn't even try and it worked. So by the second day that I was with this man, he had already driven me to another city. It seemed like we had driven for hours. I did not know where I was at. A lot of the time he would leave me in the car by myself and he would go watch my family on the news and he would come back and report to me. And he even showed me a newspaper with my face on it. And that was when I got the first glimpse of hope again, because I knew that my family was looking for me. The newspaper said, eight-year-old Vallejo girl, Mitzi Sanchez disappeared. The last day was the best day. For those two nights that I spent in his car, I couldn't sleep. I didn't, I refused to sleep. Even though he was drunk and passed out, I refused to sleep because my survival instincts had kicked in. And because of the disrespect that he did to my body, I couldn't bear anymore. And I remember looking up into the sky and all I saw were the beautiful stars that night. And that was my mental escape from where I was, even though I was trapped in this little beat up car. And I just wished that I was home. But that third day he left to ask for trash bags, which later he admitted to wanting to put my body in. And I thought to myself, I need to pray. I'm going to die today. So I need to ask for forgiveness because when I die, I need to be sure that I'm going to make it to heaven. And I jumped over into the driver's seat of the vehicle, still chained up. And I laid my head on the steering wheel and I folded my hands together. I was preparing myself for death, but God had another plan and he was preparing me for escape. The kidnapper came back. He leaned over me from the passenger side, leaned over to the driver's side, dropped the keys and he told me not to look there. So as a kid, I was very curious. I was very rebellious. And so I found the keys when he had left and it was a ring of keys. There were so many keys and I found the key to unlock the chain that was around my ankle and I unlocked it. And I was so surprised that I found the key because I was like, okay, it's unlocked. Well, what do I do now? I didn't have a plan, but I was so scared. And I remembered that he said that he was going to kill me if I tried to escape. So I locked it back up. And for a split second, I said, forget it. I'm going home. I unlocked the chain that was around my ankle. I rolled down the window to that beat up Oldsmobile and I jumped out of the window and because I had been so tired I had no energy I didn't eat or drink anything my knees buckled and I almost fell to the floor when I jumped out of the car and I couldn't even run I just walked away so I start to walk towards the street that I had seen and I can hear him yelling at me to come back and cars were driving by me. Nobody was stopping and a big diesel truck hit the corner and I got desperate and I jumped in front of the truck. The truck had to stop, otherwise he was gonna hit me. And at that point I was rather get hit by the truck than have to go back with this man. And I ran up to the truck driver's window and I said, my name is Mitzi Sanchez. I've been kidnapped. That's the man right there. And the guy got back in his car, he drove off and the truck driver got a CB radio and he took the guy's license plate number down. Seven to 11 hours later, the cops found him and arrested him. But during that time, I had to endure and questioning. I had to endure rape kit. I had to give them my clothes for evidence. And I was still with strangers, but anybody other than that man was a safe stranger to me at that point. They fed me food. Lots of food. I ate so much food that day. <laughs> and they just really took great care of me during the investigation process. But I still didn't get to see my family yet. It was hours before I got to go home. But finally, the police department took me to Vallejo. And that's where I saw my mom. 
and my aunt. I was like crying and laughing and I just had all of these emotions and they were crying, but laughing and just joy, but sadness at the same time. But I was back home and so it was like a miraculous reunion. After being reunited with my family, everything was different. When a child or an adult gets molested or gets raped, is violated, it changes you forever. You're not the same person that you were before. Your innocence gets taken. You get robbed of your dignity. The way that my family coped afterwards was very awkward. We were told um, not to talk about it. Well, my parents and my siblings were told not to ask me questions. I, of course, didn't want to talk about it because I had already had to tell the story over and over again to investigators. And we started going to therapy and my whole family went through that. It wasn't just me. And we had to prepare for trial. Therapy really helped me prepare for trial. It gave me the confidence and the experience that I needed to get up there in front of the whole courtroom and testify and point this man out and face him for the first time since he had taken me. I had to be in the same courtroom with him. I had to face him in the courtroom. I had to point him, I had to stand up and point him out in front of everybody. I had to look him in the face and say, that's the man right there sitting in the wheelchair. Curtis Dean Anderson was his name. He was sentenced to 251 years because I had such an amazing judge and jury. He had been kidnapping since the 1970s. I was taken in 2000. He was put away never to harm or hurt anybody ever again. And he ended up dying in prison after serving eight years. After the kidnapping, my family got a lot of support from the whole country. My story was a nationwide story. The whole city of Vallejo came to my house. There were so many people cars could not drive by. They were bringing gifts. They were praying. They were just there to support my family. And one thing they said to me that stuck with me my whole life was that it was not my fault. And I always think about a lot of men and women that I meet that have been abused they feel like it's their fault and no one is here to, to tell them that it's not their fault because it isn't. We have nothing to do with the reason why these people choose to violate us. It's not the way we dress. It's not something we did, but it was such a blessing that people instilled that in me without even knowing because I never carried that guilt. And that was a huge blessing for me. Our identity is not in what has happened to us. I'm not the kidnapped girl. I'm a survivor. I'm a child of God. I'm a mother. I'm a sister. I'm a daughter. I'm not what happened to me. We can be experiencing a death or grieving in, in something that we're getting through. It could be a job. It could be a breakup. It could be anything, but we carry it differently because we have hope for the future because our trials make us stronger. They make us wiser. They build our character. They give us perseverance. So we need to count it all joy when we go through these horrible things. As horrible as they are, we gotta count it all joy because it's in the end going to make us whole and complete. The Mitzi Sanchez Foundation was created to teach families what to do in the event that their child goes missing. We don't know what the first steps are other than to call the police department. And even then they tell us to stay at home and not get in the way of investigation. So we teach them what they can do from home. We're there to create a flyer. We're there to put a, a team together to disperse the flyers throughout the city, to bring the media together. We're there to bring food to feed them because we know they are not eating or shopping for toiletries and the little things that they need that they're not thinking about. So we're there to help the families in any way where we see a need. It looks different for everyone. The top three things that I would say are the most important when your child goes missing is to number one, call the police department and let them know that your child is missing. Number two is to gather things like your child's photos, one with them smiling, one with them not smiling, a toothbrush, hairbrush, 
We want to be able to get DNA samples for the investigators that come and visit your home when this does happen. And threes, you, you need a team of people to help you because you can't do it alone. My prayer for you is that you took something from what was said today, because no matter what we endure, there is hope for the future. This is Mitzi Sanchez, and thank you for listening to my story.